I want to thank Mike Green for coming all the way into my studio from his studio, uh, which are not in the same place. But, you know, anyway, Mike is here with his salt and pepper beard making me feel kind of bad and a little old. But let's not go there. Today's topic is, I think, remarkably important, and I need to kind of do a little setup on it so you'll understand why I did this. It is, believe it or not, highly technical. And if you want to figure out which is better, this site or that site, this is what real grown-up demographers use in order to make this happen. Now, you have to understand, when you're doing demographic research, you are not simply saying there are so many people who live here, or there's so many people moving here, or the competition ratio is here, and therefore we're all good. That is not really going to tell you, doctors, what you need to know, because you're going to be investing your time and your money and your credit into a site. And in order to do that, you have to project into the future, what's this area really going to be like? Is it going to be worth doing? Am I going to get a return on my investment? And that's what demographers are supposed to be doing for you. So forget this idea that you already know what all the variables mean. You, you, I mean, who does? What you really have to understand is, well, things like disinvestment effects or events. So let me explain what that means. A disinvestment event, as I'll explain as I go to my, uh, my little copy here, are those events that are going to affect the value of a site and its potential to deliver money to the person who either owns or leases it. Now, this is usually made up of things that most people don't understand as being part of demographic site analysis. To give you an example, uh, you may say competition ratio, that's really important, yeah. Uh, but the growth rate, and more importantly, the amount of money people make in an area, how much violence there is in the area, or crime statistics, these are what they refer to as a soft number because they, by themselves, they don't have some great, terrible impact that people would understand, but it is still a great and terrible impact. So, Mike, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and kind of get into this. All right, hang on. Don't go away. Where would I go? Honestly. I don't know, but we're going to call it a disinvestment event. Now that in itself is kind of an interesting number, an interesting thing, but I'm not sure people understand what we mean by a, a disinvestment event. And it really means the value of a site being better or worse, and therefore it's a disinvestment of the overall value of an area based upon events that occur within it. All right, let's just cut to the chase. There have been some riots in certain parts of the United States, particularly in the urban areas and the downtown areas. At the same time, we also had the coronavirus. And the coronavirus uh, was a disinvestment event, especially when there are a lot of people living in the area who cannot go out. So let me explain. If you were to be in Georgia, you know, the, the governor in Georgia released a lot of people, wanted to open up quickly. The same thing happened here in Utah. The governor said, guys, we are going to do this. We're open in the economy. We're going forward. But if you look at other states like New York State, where the governor kept everything closed up and really pretty buttoned down, uh, it, it became a disinvestment event that slowed the potential growth within the area. Now, if you're a guy trying to figure out, should I open a practice in this site, you have to figure out how many disinvestment events the experts are saying are in the area. So let me go on. I just want to make sure you understand. Practices, all healthcare practices are basically small businesses. They may often have, you know, three or four or five employees True, they may go bigger and they may have multiple offices, but for all intents and purposes, a small business, as defined by the federal government, is 50 
uh, employees or fewer, and very few practices, even large ones, have more than 50 employees. Now, what they mean by this is these practices are vulnerable. Being small, it just means it doesn't take a lot of waves to sink your little boat. And what we've had recently are events that are sinking people's boats. Not all boats are sinking at the same rate, however, because the turbulence within the waters are different. So I'm going to explain real quickly what we mean by vulnerability of professional practices and how not just dental or medical demographers look at it, but also other demographers. So ultimately, all professional practices are small by definition. Limited staff numbers, they have a limited number of investors. In fact, the owners of even a large uh, healthcare practice, maybe three, four at most. Sometimes you get up to 10, but for the most part, there are few, and those people are sharing the risk on the practice. Now, almost every healthcare practice depends upon patient loyalty. You could say, oh, we have so many people per doctor within my practice or within my area and say, yeah, yeah, we're, we're doing well because the ratios are working out. But no matter what, if you cheese off the people who live and work and patronize your practice, you are limiting their patient loyalty. And that makes professional practices more vulnerable than they would otherwise be. It's not entirely bad, but it's just a truth you have to keep in mind. They also have a very tiny geographic impact. Now, if we were to look at the average healthcare practice, and veterinary is included in this, and chiropractic and all the rest, usually you're looking at a five to 10 minute drive time radius that gets to roughly 70 to 80% of your patient base. It is true that some rural areas have to draw from a larger geographic area, but for the most part, they're small. And because of that, you're dependent upon a limited geographic radius. Now, it is true that in Wyoming and Montana, parts of Texas, you know, they've got a big geographic area they're covering, but most practices are in that mid-range of population density, and therefore, you're not going out that far. Therefore, an event, an event like one of these things that make you vulnerable, will have a big impact upon your practice. So, therefore, your impact on the geography that you're in is fairly small. Now, the other thing about healthcare practices that we have to say makes them a little different is, first of all, the doctor, the owner, the management of it, and other key responsibilities are concentrated often in one or two or five people. You don't have a big management team that is diversified. Now, I've been with practices and that you may have a clinical director, you may have a personnel director who runs your, your, your uh, staff relations. Uh, you may have somebody who's a facilities person, but you're not going to find that many, and they're usually divided up among people who have a say in the practice, the owners. Now, because of that, you're vulnerable. Uh, but look, number five, you have big flexibility. It means that you can meet with all the owners and the managers and the operators of your practice, and decide you're gonna change everything. You're gonna move, you're gonna open another office, you're changing everything. But it doesn't take much for you to change direction. And because of that, your flexibility is huge. Now there is a risk to being small, but there's also a benefit to being flexible. Because it may happen that one of these events that we're gonna talk about in a minute may occur and you can figure out what to do in an hour maybe two. Almost no other large business can do that. They may have to go for a management retreat for a week or call outside help with the accountants to figure out what to do. You don't. So that means even though you have some vulnerability with disinvestment events, you also have potential to make quick changes. Now, we predict the viability of a practice based upon disinvestment events or investment events. 
Now, I'm going to be honest, you could talk to your accountant about these things, and they may not know what the heck I'm talking about. Because this is kind of demographics and practice management in a level they may not know. Now, let's talk about what's going on recently throughout the United States, and I want to talk about how this is going to affect you. Look, a lot of places, not everywhere, in the country are having riots. They're having crime sprees, meaning people are running through the streets and breaking windows. Maybe they're stealing, and that happens too. There's also the potential, with like we had with the pandemic, an unemployment mandate. In other words, nobody could leave their house, nobody could go to work, and therefore, local businesses had to lay off their employees. Uh -huh. But what happened this week, and I'll talk about it in a minute, kind of changed everybody's calculus because even though it was very serious, it wasn't as long lasting as everybody thought. And I'll explain in a minute. Economic downturns do happen and sometimes they happen regionally. Now, if I am going through the little towns in Indiana, and I do, by the way, I go through the little towns and look up where the statistics are going to be where you should have a practice or avoid. And they're often economic downturns that are micro downturns, very small. They close the, uh, the greenhouses in this one particular area. By the way, we have that problem right now in our state where we can't get strawberry plants at Home Depot. It's not the worst news ever. It's just they have a supply chain problem. Well, it created a mini economic downturn in suppliers of strawberries. And so they had to come up with other things that they could do. Now, because they're small businesses, they found suppliers and they're fine. But you see, ultimately, the idea of risk and opportunities go together. And you're in a micro market. That's what healthcare really is. Now, I'm not talking about having a big hospital chain. I'm not talking about mega facilities. I'm talking about the average private practice, no matter what it is, is under this disinvestment threat all the time. Now, if you were to look at a particular place, and I've got on the map part of Los Angeles, South Central Los Angeles. This is where the town of Watts is located. The Watts riots in the 1960s were huge. And after the, uh, the murder of Martin Luther King, everybody was freaking out. And they thought, oh, nothing's going to happen that's good. They burned down and looted the local Pennies and Sears stores in Watts. Uh, Kmart got wiped out. Now, by the way, you know the Kmart, Sears, and Pennies aren't really doing that great. There may be some someplace, but the ones in Watts, that was the backbone of their economy. And local practices there depended on that retail center. And when it got burned down, a few things happened. Number one is they didn't rebuild. Uh, the local watch residents who uh, were so angry and destroyed their local economy didn't have a chance to come back and do anything. And they've been mad at all these retail centers for a long time because they didn't come back. Do I think that they're going to come back to all the parts of Michigan that got, Michigan that got burned down? Not so sure they will. They were kind of looking for excuses to close up some of those marginal big box stores anyway. But anyway, what happened was it was a predictor of bad things. And Watts was the poster child for disincentive events that happened. Violence, theft, larceny, fires, all kinds of bad things. They couldn't find employers. And it still looks a lot like a police state right now. In fact, to go to Popeye's Chicken, you feel a little bit like those banks that they have all the plastic and guns and cameras everywhere. So you can friggin' buy chicken. Well, that's the way that is, and that's the aftermath. But it creates a problem if you want to open a practice somewhere near that area because there's no money and there's no employment. Now, ultimately, disinvestment events are going to manifest themselves in demographics how many people there are, how much money they make, how many new people are moving in, new housing. Psychographics, in other words, the lifestyles of the population there are, uh, they're in, how much education they have, how far they have to commute to work, those are psychographics. But it also has a manifestation of competition. Because in Watts and in other parts of the United States, the competition dropped off almost entirely. If you happen to be in a private practice, 
it's very unlikely you're going to say, you know what, I think I'm going to rebuild in that particular area. There's too much perceived risk. It may not even be real, but that's what people are doing. And therefore, as we look at all these events that happen, people are thinking again, should I open here? Now, there are technical innovations that may make these disinvestment events mitigated in some way. In other words, there may have been a big office building that they closed down and now people work from home. And that's a good example of a technological innovation that is allowing some parts of the country to bounce back very fast. If you are in a professional practice and you wanna say, I wanna go someplace where there are not other people, you look for a disinvestment event where everybody else moved out and you may find serious advantage for yourself. So yeah, you have to have a counterintuitive way of thinking about practice locations. And that's what this is all about. Now, granted, there are gonna be some sociological changes. We know that some parts of Watts were almost entirely black. In other words, very few Hispanics or Asians lived in that area. However, Hispanics moved in in the 1970s and 80s, big time. And then a significant number of East Asians, and I'm talking specifically Chinese, Koreans, and Vietnamese, moved into these areas and sociological changes occurred. What it meant was the patient base that they were depending on isn't there anymore, it shifted. And I'm assuming the same thing is gonna happen here because of the disinvestment events that are happening. Now, where are disinvestment events happening most? California is number one. There have been more disinvestment events per capita in California than anywhere. Now, you may have been thinking, oh, Chicago, oh, New York. Yeah, those are seriously impacted by disinvestment events. And demographers put a score out there that they will never tell you about that deal with that. Now, what's going on in California that is really going to matter? Well, I want to share a few of those things with you. Number one, they're going to have a property tax increase in California that is going to make almost everything happening in Chicago or Illinois look like it's not that big a deal. Property taxes are going up because Prop 8 has been overturned. For those of us old enough to remember the Prop 8 in the 1970s, it was to stop huge increases in property taxes. And it's allowing it to go up. Now, I should also say, the price of property in California has gone up because of mandates. So you know that every house has to have uh, solar panels. Every new house in California does. That adds between twenty dollars and $25,000 to every house, no matter how big, in California. So people are rethinking it. Sales taxes are going up to cover all of the other problems in California. They don't have enough money to run the government. Part of that is because of the next item, unfunded mandates. Now, there are all kinds of mandates, and I've mentioned a couple in housing, that are increasing the cost of living that are pretty dramatic. The uh, CalPERS, which is the state-run retirement plan, is effectively going bankrupt because they kept promising all kinds of things to the state union members. Uh, California has this huge state employees union. Well, they don't have the money to make it go. It's an unbudget balanced budget. And the state of California has been spending, I don't want to say like a drunken sailor, that kind of insults drunken sailors. But what's happened is they've got so much debt and they don't know how to make that debt go away. Practically, they figure the only thing we can do is tax everybody because that's the easy way that governments can do it. And they don't want to turn loose the private sector to be able to really go. Uh, a manifestation of that was in California, they had a drought. Did they let the farmers have water so they could grow more crops and therefore bring more money in? Uh, they did not because they didn't particularly like farmers in California. So therefore, they created a, an imbalance that they're still trying to get out of. Now, the other thing that's happening in California, there's a lot of social unrest, as you know. Los Angeles, San Francisco, Bay Area, even the inner city, uh, probably the, uh, the uh, Central Valley, for instance, in Bakersfield and in Sacramento, 
They're not doing so great. These add to the disinvestment events. Now, it doesn't mean that they're the only place in the country that is having that. As a friend of mine told me yesterday, who is visiting in New York, uh, she's a rather well-known stage actress, and she said New York died, but nobody could go to the funeral because we're all locked down. Meaning, in other words, it doesn't look like it's going to come back anytime soon. I am not talking about New York as an entire place. I'm talking about New York City, and in particular, three boroughs within New York, and I won't go into those right now. But yeah, they've got problems, and they can't figure out what to do about it. Who decides that we are winning? Who is going to be the one to throw their hands up and say, we've crossed the victory line. Come on back to New York City. Well, unfortunately, it isn't the mayor. The governor is having a little bit of a, of a row with New York City's mayor. And I think this is going to be one of those interesting disinvestment events where the grownups are supposed to wrestle it out, make sure it all gets fixed, and it's not happening. Now, California, Michigan, New York City, Minnesota, and Illinois, meaning Chicago area, are really having disinvestment uh, investment events, and nobody seems to be able to have a handle on it. Now, when you tell the population, we hate you, we don't like you, get out of here, people tend to listen and they go somewhere else. Where are they going? All right, now you've probably seen this list or one similar to it, but here's the deal. Texas is not having disinvestment events. It opened itself back up in its economy. It's got a diverse economy and it's doing pretty well. Everybody is surprised right now about Southern Nevada. I'm talking about uh, Clark County, specifically uh, Las Vegas. This kind of kicked everybody right in the head. They didn't realize Nevada was coming back so fast, but it is. And this isn't just, by the way, for just Las Vegas, but for all of the cities associated with it down there. It's kind of like they decided, screw all the rest of the problems the other parts of the country are having. We're going to party and we're going to party hard. Same thing happened in Arizona. Now, Maricopa County is Phoenix, but Pima County is uh, Tucson. And Tucson surprised everybody by all of a sudden deciding not to play. It wanted to open up and all parts of Arizona right now are looking excellent. Coronavirus hasn't had a big effect. Civil unrest in Arizona is like, well, I'd rather golf. I don't really want to riot today. So Arizona's doing well. Idaho last year was the fastest growing state in the United States. Not because Idaho is that fascinating. I mean, I mean, I can get as full of uh, potatoes as the next guy. It's just Washington State decided to have a terrible time. And then people have decided to move to a place in Idaho where they can afford to live. Same thing happened in Utah, where they decided, hey, all you guys in California, come on to uh, Utah. The number of single family dwellings and the low cost of those has made Utah all of a sudden spark and jump and they're just dazzling. I have to bring up the point that Florida is one of those states that's decided it's not playing either. Now, I bring these up not because these are the only places to put a practice in the United States. These are just the places that right now, today, are the low hanging fruit and we're seeing lots and lots and lots of growth. Do you have to be on the right coast of Florida to make it happen? You do. Does it matter east versus a west Idaho? Yeah, it matters. Does it matter how close to the California border you are in Arizona? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. But you see, knowing some of these investment events, not disinvestment events, are helping professionals figure out where should I put my practice. Now, because of the size of healthcare practices, you have to realize you are having an impact on the national economy in a way you didn't think you were going to. And in fact, stories have come out about doctors, and I'm talking specifically physicians, dentists, and veterinarians that are just rocking it, even in places that are doing badly otherwise. Because healthcare needs are not slowing down, and that's why I've got faith in you. Now, Increased statistics this week are very important. I got I got to do something quick here. There are several cities that have just this week voted to defund their police. 
uh, how they're going to handle it. <laughs> I'm anxious to see it. Uh, those of us who remember uh, some of the rock concerts like uh, Woodstock where they invited the Hells Angels in because they didn't want the police to be there. I, how did that work out, old hippies? Do you know? Uh, not well. Several cities are actually considering continuing their lockdown. Others states have said, we're sick of this. We ain't doing that. You're allowing protesters to go out and, and do things. And they don't seem to be getting so sick. So I think the uh, cities are going to not continue lockdown overall, but some are just being uh, very anxious to do that continually. Violent protests apparently are continuing, and, but they're very localized. This is the thing I thought was particularly interesting. They, they are we're reading about them, but we're not seeing them everywhere. And frankly, the military right now is at odds with the political class, which is surprising everybody. A lot of generals are not so happy with what's going on in Washington, D.C. I tend to think the guys who write the paychecks are going to win that battle, but I'm just saying those happen to be statistics that are being a big deal. But I need to remind you what happened yesterday. The NASDAQ Composite Index closed at a record high. Huge. The Standard & Poor 500 turned positive for the year. All that stuff, all the terrible news, well, forget it, it doesn't count anymore because the S&P 500 actually turns out to be profitable, and that's the high-tech sector, sector along with the NASDAQ. Energy stocks got a boost from OPEC meaning they're restricting production and oil and gas prices may go up, but not overly dramatically, which just basically means that a lot of parts of the country that are in fracking and in overall uh, energy market are doing better. And that surprised everybody. And all those top three items happened in one day. The shares on airlines, retailers, cruise liners, and other companies T uh, that are tied to the uh, reopening of the economy led the market much higher. So in other words, on Monday of this week, we had a record stock market week. Increased employment also happened. Uh, last Friday, there was a huge jobs report. People are going back to work and they're not going back to work because they're scared to. And here's what's kind of weird about it. All the stuff on this slide right now is in contrast to all the riots and the discontent. It just pretty much means that, yeah, we understand there's civil unrest and all these terrible things are happening, but the protesters are kind of mad because it doesn't look like anybody cares anymore because of what happened yesterday. How permanent this is, I don't know. It can all change in a day. But I'm just saying, if you know where these things are happening, You'll want to know because it's going to be a good time for you to invest back in the professional practice market. Now, there are anecdotal news events that are happening. Don't assume that they're happening everywhere. They happen some places. They may be a big deal locally, but they're not everywhere. The trends for a broader market are what you want to be tracking. And if you want to know where to put a practice, you got to figure out what's happening within the broad market here not what's happening in the other side of the country in a town that you don't really need. There's also bifurcated impacts, meaning, in other words, the economy is walking and chewing gum. It means that there are some people that are very excited to do something. They want to get going this summer, and they're not going along with the narrative they're hearing from others. Now, let me tell you what I'm doing in my company. Mike and I are trying to read everything we possibly can to figure out where are things getting better? And where are things really getting worse and won't turn around? Some places that were supposed to be good aren't. Some places that are doing great are. Now, what side will America voters choose to go with in the election? That's a pretty big question. Are they going to side on the, the, the side of the country should shrink, or the country should grow? Are they going to want to be in a place where the things look a little healthy and there's a little more optimism or negativity? Now, that's a tough question. I don't know the answer, absolutely, but I'm going to tell you what I kind of am guessing. I kind of think the idea is people, particularly professionals, doctors, are going to say, 
I don't want to be where everybody is down depressed and dying. I want to go someplace that things are growing. Therefore, some cities in the United States are going to die and some are going to grow. That's just a fact of life. Now, I'm still offering the flash report for the demographics. We're probably going to wrap it up in just a couple of days. And we've gotten a lot of people who've ordered these reports. It's basically a, a demographic report that runs for about half price. We've done it because there are a lot of people who've been whining and having a real problem. We're still discounting the marketing report, which is kind of Mike's baby. And I just want to make sure you understand, Mike has got a podcast he does. And, and maybe some of you have seen it. I'm going to tell you something. I'm thoroughly impressed. Not just because I taught Mike everything he knows. No, there are other reasons for that, but you know, I'm, I'm impressed. His whole idea of handling uh, what the major trends are in marketing and how to use them for a professional practice, I think is nothing short of brilliant. Now look, you guys, we offer a marketing report. This is the best, most cost-effective way to figure out how to promote your practice. Mike comes out and visits people throughout the United States. He can work with your office. He can work with your team to make sure your staff and the doctors are using what they've got during this time of transition. Not everybody's taking advantage of it. I know that. And I know Mike doesn't just love traveling all the time. But what he's doing is brilliant. And uh, Mike, is there anything you want to add to this? You know, uh, we're at time. But the thing that I was thinking about as you're talking through this is that especially when we're talking about marketing but actually practice placement as well we're playing the long game in, in, in most cases not in every case but in, in most cases we're playing the long game and so it's really important to understand historically what's happened in the area that you're considering and be prepared for whatever hap may happen in the future and the doctors that have their minds wrapped around those two things are much better suited to deal with a disinvestment event that, that may happen that was unexpected. And if they're playing the long, long game they, and have that perspective in the strategy that they're deploying, they insulate themselves uh, much, much better than doctors that, that are not thinking in those terms. And for those of you that, that are not looking at the historical numbers, which we provide in great detail, in the reports that we that we do, um, you're really uh, you're you're cheating yourself of of some important numbers of showing when the growth happened, um, if it's happening, and and how it's predicted for the future. And you can develop a much stronger strategy by understanding the historical numbers, growth patterns, his uh, disinvestment uh, events, and investment events that happened over that period of time, so that you can make the best decision not only in marketing, but also in practice placement. Uh, now, Mike, real quick, how do they get onto your uh, my, uh, marketing thing? So and, the best, and you have a series you're starting, right? Yeah, the best, the best thing to do is to go to the website, and under the training tab, there is whiteboard training, and that's, that's what I've titled it. So that, just click on that, and you'll be able to find all of those episodes. Uh, I, I'm finding it a remarkable resource, and and guys, if you're not using it, you know, it's kind of on you. Uh, he, uh, Mike is is starting a series where you can go into several classes, in which you will learn the fundamentals of practice promotion. And I'm telling you, it, it's very good, very well researched. And uh, like I said, Mike has uh, gotten a lot better. I mean, you should have seen him at the beginning. My God. Oh my gosh, kind of pathetic. He didn't have a beard, you know, <laughs> back then. So anyway, you guys, thank you so much for listening. Sorry to go over, but uh, I hope you find this useful. Take care.